Hi, I'm Frank O'Brien, and welcome to another get together for the InfoAid Space Flight Lecture Series. This month, we're going to be talking about the most important science mission that NASA is working on the James Webb Space Telescope. When the Hubble Telescope was launched over 30 years ago, it opened up views and insights into the universe that just revolutionized astronomy. Arguably, it's one of the most important scientific instruments of the 20th century. I've been volunteering at InfoAge for almost 15 years, and I've been giving talks on spaceflight for much of that time. And about nine years ago, I was selected to become a NASA Solar System Ambassador. This is an outstanding all-volunteer program that takes me into the community to talk about the NASA mission. No tax dollars are spent on it, and we never accept any kind of compensation. Compared to the 60-year history of the space age, spacecraft focused on astronomy, particularly in the visible light range, are a comparatively new development in large part because the ground-based telescopes were doing really pretty great work. Even the 200-inch, and that's 5 meters, Hale Telescope on Mount Palomar wasn't obsolete even in 1990, despite having been built at the, uh, right after the Second World War. It was equipped with an incredibly large mirror and the ability to record images on high-resolution film. With those advantages, space-based telescopes offered very little extra. Telescopes with large mirrors were simply too heavy for existing rockets to launch. Additionally, using film, which is an expendable resource that has to be returned to Earth, was simply, it was just a non-starter. Now, launched over 30 years ago, the Hubble Space Telescope was a breakthrough achievement. It was one of the very first telescopes in space that viewed the universe in the visible part of the spectrum. It had a large mirror, 2.4 uh, meters, which is over 6 feet uh, in diameter. Most importantly, it used the new, at the time, CCD detectors to record images. These are similar to the image sensors used in digital cameras today, just like in your phone. Uh, the combination of outstanding optics, a vantage point high above the atmosphere, and the sophisticated sensors that it carried made the Hubble a world-class observatory. Unfortunately, Hubble is getting old, as we all are, I guess. It's been over a decade since its last servicing, and it's starting to show its age. Half of its gyroscopes, which are necessary to maintain the precise orientation in space, have already failed, and some of its instruments have also failed. Hubble is expected to continue operating into the mid-2020s, maybe a little bit further on, and then it'll sadly become just another piece of space junk. So, with the Hubble facing the end of its life in the next few years, it's essential that we have a replacement for this great observatory. So, why not just build another one? This should be easy. We, we've done it already. Well, Hubble has done its job admirably well. And almost too well, as it's given us answers to questions that we didn't even know existed when it was first launched. But more importantly, the knowledge it generated created far more difficult questions than Hubble can possibly answer. So, any telescope that replaces Hubble needs to have far more science capabilities. When we begin planning, for a new space mission. The first 
and most important step is to find exactly what we want to accomplish. Okay, that's a good idea. For the Webb telescope, these objectives were incredibly bold. We want to see as far back in time as possible, to the point just after when the universe, after the Big Bang, cooled enough so that visible light became possible. Next, we want to see how the earliest galaxies assembled themselves and what might have been a determinant for whether they turn into a spiral galaxy like our own Milky Way or simply jumbles of billions of stars without any apparent structure. The very early stars will be an important observation because their evolutionary path directly affects how stars are formed in more modern times. Today, we see in countless places that where stars form, we also find disks of gas and dust that are surrounding that new star. These will eventually go on to form planets. Were the early stars also creating their own planetary nurseries? We don't know. And if they weren't, when did planets become common? Finally, the Webb Telescope will investigate some of the thousands of new planets we've already discovered with other spacecraft, and they will also determine whether they have any atmosphere. The composition of any atmospheres would give insights on whether life might exist on them. Now, importantly, Webb is primarily an infrared telescope, meaning that the majority of the images it takes will be part of the a part of the spectrum that is below visible light. As a result, we won't be getting the same type of beautiful pictures we get with Hubble. At visible wavelengths, the usual dust and gas that's in the universe would completely obscure the view. When viewing in the infrared, this gas and dust is nearly transparent allowing us to see what's behind it. To see this difference, take a look at the classic Hubble picture of the Eagle Nebula, which has been nicknamed the Pillars of Creation for the planets that are being formed there. The image on the left is through the visible light camera, but the one on the right uses Hubble's very short-lived infrared camera. You can see and study countless new images, I'm sorry, countless new stars in that infrared image. Now, the idea of a telescope is it that uh, the idea of a telescope as a time machine seems a little bit silly, but makes sense when you think of it. Light travels at a finite speed, about 186,000 miles a second and is the ultimate speed limit in the universe. But space is big, and it's really, really big, especially when we're thinking about faraway objects such as the stars and other galaxies. The time it takes the light uh, to go from those objects to us can be really pretty considerable. As an example, here's a picture of, the, uh, of Jupiter that the Hubble telescope took in August. When you go outside to see Jupiter, and honestly right now in September, it's a beautiful sight right now, you're seeing it as it existed almost an hour ago. That's because Jupiter is about half a billion miles away, and it light takes that long to travel the distance to Earth. The closest star to Earth, Proxima Centauri, is even more distant. Light takes over four years to get here. But that's nothing when comparing against the closest galaxy to our Milky Way. Andromeda, you might hear it called M31, is the closest galaxy to Earth and it is visible to the naked eye only on very, very dark nights. We wouldn't see this in New Jersey. But know that the light you're seeing has been traveling over two and a half million years. That's a really long time. Now, an interesting phenomena happens when you're looking at objects that are very far away. 
Edwin Hubble, yeah, the guy that the telescope is named after, proved that the universe is expanding. And the further an object was, the faster it is moving. Now that's all very, very interesting, but what has that got to do with the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, take a look at what's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Image. This was an enormous undertaking and required months of observation time. We're just barely able to see objects that were created about a billion years after the Big Bang. So we're looking about 12 and a half billion years ago. Notice one thing, they're all red. This is the result of something that's very familiar in everyday life. We're very familiar with the effect known as the Doppler shift. For sound, this is when a siren approaching us has a higher pitch, which lowers after that police or fire truck passes. The amount of change is proportional to the speed the uh, vehicle is moving. There's a barely noticeable difference when the truck is moving slowly, but when it's moving quickly, the Doppler shift is really pretty apparent. Even with our eyes closed, we can pretty accurately guess when the fire truck passes by us just by listening to the siren's change in pitch. Now, that was with sound. What might be surprising is that the exact same thing happens with light. In our expanding universe, virtually all the galaxies are moving away from us at tremendous speeds. In the same manner with sound, where the frequency is lower as the object moves away, the frequency of light is lower when the object is traveling away from us. This makes the light more reddish. And since the more distant they are, the faster they are traveling, the consequence is that more light waves, or the light waves, are even more stretched out. Since the effect is to make the uh, objects appear more red, we refer to this as the redshift. There's only a few examples of stars and a few galaxies that are moving toward us, and these are called blue shifted because they're going closer to the blue end of the spectrum, but these are actually quite few and far between. Now, we can calculate the amount of redshift by how much the spectral lines of a galaxy move toward the red end of the spectrum. In extreme cases, the light that we would normally see moves completely into the infrared part of the spectrum. This is the region that the James Webb Telescope intends to study, and it's very, very hard to do because the Earth is so warm, and the Earth's heat easily drowns out the faint infrared signals that the web is looking for. So, it's impossible to have a ground-based telescope perform the types of observations that are necessary to see the earliest moments of the universe. Now, yeah, like so many other big space pro uh, science projects, the origins of the Webb Telescope began with a broad wish list from scientists about what their next goal should be. Meetings and discussion continued for several years, and in 2001, the uh, Webb Telescope was selected as the highest priority uh, astronomy mission for NASA. It would take several years of preliminary design work before a formal contract to build the space, uh, the telescope could be awarded. And almost immediately, designers realized that this was going to be far more difficult than they originally thought. Because of these troubles, and yes, a problem with management and other issues, costs and schedules were thrown out the window. Additionally, a number of failed tests and procedures caused delays, and this pushed the deadlines for the telescope even further. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic halted progress for several months, but now workers are 
going as fast as they possibly can. Now, it's easy to ask the question why a project is so terribly late and horribly over budget. The answer, in most cases, is that it's complicated. When the Webb Telescope was first proposed, its science goals were far more modest, and the problems of flying a truly large observatory simply weren't appreciated. As proposals for the de uh, design evolved, more and more new technologies would needed to be introduced. Now, scientists, ever optimistic, submitted a plan that seemed reasonable. Oh, yes, it required a few new technologies for the mirrors and cooling and the instruments, but these were considered doable and acceptable risks. The reality turned out to be far more challenging than anyone expected, and years of scheduled delays and billions of dollars were added uh, uh, to the project. Now, the Hubble telescope exists in an orbit rather close to Earth and was designed to be serviced by astronauts on the space shuttle. Webb is designed to operate about a million miles from Earth, which is about four times further away than the Moon. Even if the shuttle was still flying, there would be no way for humans to reach Webb. And even if a mission could be made, there's no user serviceable parts inside the telescope. So this demands an even higher standard for reliability, requiring exhaustive testing to make certain that everything absolutely positively works. Complicating the testing is simply the sheer size of the telescope. With a sun shield the size of a tennis court and a main mirror about 21 feet across, there is simply no rocket today, or even proposed, that can carry Webb in its operational configuration. As a result, it's folded up like origami to fit in the nose of the rocket. This requires a delicate and complex unfolding of the telescope, whose every step has to work perfectly, or the Webb will turn into simply an expensive piece of space junk. We're going to show you that unfolding process toward the end of the talk. Now, I know that's a lot of background, but it was necessary to explain why such a, uh, it was necessary to explain why this is such a difficult but necessary project. Now let's take a look at the spacecraft in more detail. Here's the nearly completed telescope. And the first thing you notice is that huge 21 foot wide main mirror. It's made out of 18 hexagonal segments, all mod uh, mounted with a precision of about one micron. That's a millionth of a meter or a fraction of a width of a hair. In front and behind the mirror, you'll see uh, the folded up sunshade, which will again open up to the size of a tennis court and keep the telescope very, very cold. Now, the sun shield is an essential part of the telescope. Since there's no tube or baffles shielding the mirror, one use is that it blocks the sunlight from hitting the mirror. But its most important task is to reflect the heat away up that's coming in from the sun and the earth. Now, why is this important? Well, remember, most of the observations that the Webb Telescope will be doing will be in the infrared. In order to see distant galaxies in the infrared, we have to be colder than the light we're receiving. In this case, the instruments have to be just a few degrees above absolute zero. In our case, we're going to have detectors that are only six degrees above absolute zero or about minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun shield helps a lot, and it'll be about 200 degrees on the sun-facing side and about minus 390 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. Now, we're going to have to work really hard to make this even colder. Now, oh, before we go, one thing that you might notice, 
the main mirror folds up. This is necessary again because you simply can't fit the mirror unfolded in any known rocket. The mirror itself is a miracle of precision optics. Only a tiny whiff of gold is necessary to coat the mirrors, and it adds up only to a few ounces. But why gold? Why not something more conventional like the aluminum that's used in almost all ground-based telescopes? Well, aluminum is great for optical astronomy, but here we are doing our most important work in the infrared, and aluminum just doesn't reflect infrared light as well as gold. Each of the 18 mirror segments is also able to adjust itself to produce the most perfect focus possible. Mirrors are also unique in that they're made out of a slab of beryllium, not glass. Not only are they far, far lighter and stiffer than glass, but they're also relatively unaffected by the extreme cold that they're going to be experiencing. Several years of the Webb Telescope's development was dedicated to learning just how to make these mirrors. First, starting with little mirrors, then working their way up to final uh, about 1.3 meters size was a critical part of technology development. And if unsurmountable problems occurred, well, the prob project would probably have to be scrapped. In the end, by the time the flight mirrors were made, the companies had mastered this process. Now, just for a fun, great fun fact, how do you make certain that the surface of the mirrors are perfectly clean? Spraying Windex on them certainly isn't an option. No, you blast them with a, a spray of carbon dioxide snow. It evaporates cleanly, it doesn't leave any residue, and there's no lint from a cloth left behind. Here engineers are cleaning the smaller, secondary mirror of the telescope. Behind the main mirror is the integrated science instrument module. This is where all the devices that study the light that's taken in by the mirror. There's about four instruments housed here. Three near-infrared cameras and spectrographs, and a mid-infrared spectrograph. As you can imagine, all these instruments operate in the infrared spectrum. This is invisible to the naked eye, but that doesn't mean that it won't return any pictures. The images that you will see will be in false color. Color is assigned to draw out the important scientific details, and in the end they will all probably look very, very good, just like a lot of the Hubble pictures. Now, to see how all this works, here we have the spectacular picture of the remnants of a supernova called Cassiopeia A. The picture is usually attributed to the Hubble, but the Hubble only took a small part of the picture. Only the visible light from the supernova was photographed by Hubble, and you'll see it's colored yellow. The Spitzer Space Telescope took an infrared photo, and this is colored red. Finally, the Chandra X-ray Observatory recorded the X-ray emissions from the supernova remnant, and they're colored blue and green. So, everything in red, green, and blue is actually invisible to the human eye, but by assigning visible colors to that data, we get a much more useful and comprehensive picture of this object. Now, another very clever technology that was invented for the Webb Telescope was a novel way of collecting hundreds of thousands of spectra of stars and other objects. This allows scientists to only select the interesting parts of the image for spectral analysis. To do this, we built a detector that has about 250,000 nearly microscopic windows, each with an individually controlled shutter that acts as a door which opens and closes to allow or block light. When, researchers, when a researcher wants to study a particular part of the sky, they'll select any number of these shutters to open, 
and collect individual spectra from that tiny part of the image. Now, each shutter is really tiny. There's, they're only about the size of a few strands of hair across. And as you can imagine, this was an impossibly hard technology to make and make and work reliably. Now, another terribly difficult piece of technology in, uh, invented for the Webb telescope is called a cryocooler. Now remember, we have this massive sunshade that reflects away most of the warmth from the sun and the earth. On the cold side of the sunshade, the temperature is a bitter, frigid, minus 390 degrees Fahrenheit. Unfortunately, that's far too hot for the mid-infrared uh, instrument to operate at. So, MIRI, as it's known, as the instrument's known, has to be far, far colder and operates at only a few degrees above absolute zero. So, cooling has to be done by a special refrigeration unit. This cryocooler, as it's known, is far different than the refrigeration units that you'll have at home or air conditioners that we're all familiar with. In addition to the usual requirements demanded for space hardware, that is, it has to be very light and incredibly reliable, an additional requirement made this effort especially difficult. Because the Webb telescope can stare at a spot in the sky very precisely for long periods of time, the cryocooler can't have any vibrations that would allow the images to be blurred. This was, again, one of the challenges that caused tremendous delays in the telescope's production schedule. Now, as we've mentioned before, the Webb telescope, when fully deployed, is far lower, too large to fit on an existing rocket. So, it has to be carefully folded up to fit inside the rocket's nose. And this isn't an unusual task. Almost all satellites need to extend solar panels, antennas, and a host of instruments right after they launch. But on the web, every deployment is absolutely critical, as it doesn't have a backup. And so the packaging of the spacecraft for launch has to be done very, very carefully. Engineers performed a huge amount of testing to ensure that everything would operate perfectly. There's all, there are so many steps in this process that it's actually easier just to watch a video on all the events that must occur. So let's have a look. The James Webb Space Telescope is the largest space telescope ever built. Its tennis court-sized sunshield, along with its 21-foot, 3-inch primary mirror, will enable Webb's instruments to see back in time to when the first stars and galaxies formed after the Big Bang, more than 13 billion years ago. But Webb's size is too big to fit into any existing rocket, so it's designed to be folded like origami, so it fits inside the almost 15-foot wide payload fairing of the very powerful Ariane 5 rocket. Once in space, the Webb telescope is slowly unfolded in a well-choreographed series of deployments. The solar panel is deployed first to provide power. About 12 hours after liftoff, Webb's thrusters are fired in what's called a mid-course correction burn to fine-tune Webb's trajectory. About 24 hours after liftoff, Webb's high-gain antenna is deployed, enabling communication with ground controllers. Webb is traveling so fast, it passes the moon in about two days. Here, a second mid-course correction burn sets the spacecraft on course toward its orbital destination. On day three, special pallets holding Webb's folded sunshield deploy. First, the forward pallet, then the aft pallet. Webb's central tower is extended lifting Webb's telescope and instrument package to its operational location. Webb's momentum flap is deployed. As the sun's solar pressure pushes against Webb's large sunshield, this flap helps stabilize the telescope. Special covers hold Webb's tennis court-sized sunshield in place during launch. These covers are now released, 
freeing the sunshield for deployment. The first of Webb's sunshield mid-booms deploys, unfolding and extending one side of the five-layer Kapton sunshield. Then, the second sunshield mid-boom deploys. Once both booms are fully deployed, the center rim is deployed and the sunshield is slowly tensioned. This separates the five layers. On the sun-facing side of the telescope, a radiator shade deploys to protect Webb's spacecraft systems from the sun's heat reflected off the sunshield. Near the 10-day mark, the MIRI Instruments cryocooler is started. It begins lowering the MIRI Instruments temperature to about 6 degrees above absolute zero. Controllers now begin the process of deploying Webb's optics. Webb's secondary mirror deploys first. Then, an additional radiator panel behind the telescope deploys. This helps remove more heat from the spacecraft. About 12 days after launch, the first wing of the primary mirror is rotated into place. A few days later, the other mirror wing is rotated into place. About 30 days after launch, another mid-course correction burn further tunes Webb's course toward its final operational orbit, about one million miles away from Earth. For the next several months, optics engineers using Webb's NearCam instrument will align and focus Webb's 18 primary mirror segments into a perfect monolithic mirror. It will take about six months before Webb is fully ready to capture its first science image. We've come a long way in our journey to create the most powerful space telescope ever built. And no, it wasn't easy, but stretching technology so far never is. And we have made huge progress. The Webb Telescope is finally assembled completely and is in now its final integration and test phase. As of now, there haven't been any showstopper problems. Once testing is completed in California, it'll be packed up, loaded on a ship, travel through the Panama Canal, and into the European Space Agency's launch complex in French Guiana, which is in South America. As part of its contribution to the Webb Telescope, the European Space Agency will launch the Webb Telescope on one of their own large, very large, Ariane 5 rockets. If all of it goes well, the launch date is now planned for October 2021. Once the telescope is on its way, it'll spend a month deploying all those uh, essential bits and pieces that we just saw in the video. Engineers will spend the next five months checking and verifying every component on the web, ensuring that it'll be ready for researchers to use. But we might get some preliminary data and pictures early on, but the commissioning process won't be complete until April of 2022. Well, that's the latest on what will be the greatest astronomical device in history. Stay tuned, as we're likely going to have a follow-up talk later next year when we get some results back from the telescope. Now, speaking of upcoming talks, next month I'm going to be talking about the X-15. It was a truly pioneering rocket plane, and the knowledge we gained by flying it nearly 200 times was critical for developing the space shuttle. So we'll see you then.